Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's Deep Dive Insider Town Hall. We are so glad that you would take part of your Saturday to join us. Uh, my name is Devin Cox. I host the Washington State Indivisible podcast. We are going to be talking about the budgeting process in the state legislature. Uh, thank you so much before we begin to Cap Pipkin with the Washington Indivisible Network. Also, Julian Jievsky, Robin Gittleman, Louise Pate, and Kevin Jones. And of course, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that we live and work on the ancestral homelands of many indigenous peoples throughout the Pacific North. Northwest. So these deep dive town halls are pretty exciting uh, to me in particular because uh, they're really designed to help us as activists be more knowledgeable and therefore be more effective. We're unpacking some very big subjects, lawmaking, redistricting, and now the budgeting process today. Uh, so I'm going to be taking notes right along with you. And uh, I will just say, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat bar. We will get to as many as we can in maybe the last 15 minutes of today's presentation. Um, we are so fortunate to have 45th LD State Senator Monka Dingra with us today. Uh, she is, she of course has a deep knowledge of the subject matter of the budgeting process, but she's also in several leadership positions that impact the budgeting process. And she uh, has played a big role in setting the agenda for Democrats in the legislature. She serves on the Ways and Means Committee. She is the Majority Deputy Leader of the Senate and a member of the Special Committee on Economic Recovery. She's also the chair of the state, uh, or the, rather the Senate Behavioral Health Committee Subcommittee and the vice chair of the Senate Law and Justice Committee. Senator Dingra, hello. Thank you for being here on a Saturday. We really appreciate it. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. I always love chatting uh, with this group and I really look forward to this conversation. Me too. And I will just, before we get started, I will just ask you, how did the first week of uh, virtual session go uh, in the legislature? You know, I think it went better than I expected. We were able to have all our committee um, hearings, hear from people all over the state, uh, people who traditionally didn't have the opportunity to drive to Olympia to participate in their democracy now participated in their democracy sitting in their homes. And that was really lovely to see. Um, you know, Monday was a bit challenging because we had to have the National Guard out and the troopers out given the incidents of last week, um, what happened at our national capital and what happened uh, even at the, our governor's mansion. So that was a little unsettling. Uh, I don't think any of us ever want our democracy to be threatened in this way. And so um, it was a little jarring to see all the troops out there, but unfortunately it was needed. Uh, we got through that, but um, the session's off to a good start. We even had some floor action and we did that virtually on Wednesday. So um, I am really looking forward to a, a robust, effective and efficient um, session, but I will ask for everyone's patience as we <laughs> go through the next hundred days. Well, you know, as you say, this is a democratizing uh, development in that people who may not have been able to participate in the past are participating now. So that's certainly an upside. And, and of course, as you mentioned, the National Guard being there, we are so grateful uh, for them and also grateful for the safety of you and the other lawmakers. So you're here to help us understand the budgeting process. And this is the one thing that the legislature is constitutionally required to do. I think a lot of people see our budgets as moral documents. I'm wondering, you personally as a lawmaker, what do you think our budget says about our priorities? You know, to me, I've always said this, our budget is our value statement. What we value is what we put our dollars behind. And, um, you know, we can pass all the policies what we want. We can make all these pretty words that reads like a lovely novel. But if the, if the money isn't behind those words, those words do not help anyone. And so to me, this is our value statement. If, you, if we value something, it has to be in the budget and there have to be appropriate dollars behind that. Because you can't just put half the money in. You're not gonna get half a program. You're gonna get no program. And so my push really has been to say, you don't have to have 20 programs, you know? Pick the five that really impact people's lives and fund them appropriately. And um, so really when we take a look at a budget, it is about making sure we have enough funds to get the desired result. 
And so I really want to make sure we get away from trying to appease everyone to really concentrating on those things that can help people's lives. It's interesting that you say that and in, in, in preparation, you and I were talking about this very dynamic in that, you know, policy is ultimately just it's, it's worth the paper that it's written on if it doesn't actually impact lives. And so before we get into the budget, I would like to talk about the priorities that the Democratic caucus has set for this session. You were the majority deputy leader of the Senate, as I said, so you played a hand in this. And we have four legislative priorities for the session on the Democratic side. The first is economic recovery. The second is COVID. The third is police reform slash racial equity. And the fourth is climate crisis. Um, I will just ask you, how were these chosen and, and why were these particular four chosen? Yeah, you know, and this is actually um, a really great question because I think people really need to know the process that we go through in order to develop our policies, our priorities. So um, we as a caucus meet uh, a few times after session has ended. You know, we get back together, really reflect on how the session went and start talking about what we're planning on doing the following year. And so we go through this exercise where people really write down and talk about things that are important to them. And so it is like any kind of, um, um, you know, activity you see teams do or businesses do where you throw everything you want and like up out um, on, uh, on a board. We actually did a virtual board uh, this time have all the members talk about it, break into little groups and try to distill down on it, um, you know, reflect on it, come back in a couple of months and, um, you know, try to group them into different categories. And so we did this exercise uh, multiple times and then came up with these four big buckets. Now, if you notice, these big buckets are fairly large, right? Um, COVID recovery, what does that look like? There are a lot of things that go under that. And so there are the big buckets that really have a whole bunch of, um, I'll say stones to keep up with this analogy, um, that fill up that bucket. And uh, so this is where the consensus in our caucus was that we were going to prioritize. And this also helps us as leadership when we have limited time on the floor. And if there are like 10 bills, we're not just gonna pick the ones we like because it's not about what a personal Senator likes. It's about, are we putting in bills that are consistent with our values? And so we go back to this document to say, okay, we only have time for five bills. There are 10 bills ready. How do we prioritize this? We're gonna make sure we pick the ones that the caucus has agreed to are part of our priority. So that is how we set that session. And I'll say a lot of these priorities are also set on what we hear from our constituents and people. When we're hearing from people that this is what they need, uh, so when we go through this exercise, that is um, in front of mind for us. It's it's what we're hearing from people. So it really is um, Washingtonians who are communicating with us that we then distill up and then develop our uh, priorities from. Well, that circles right back to what we were just previously talking about, about how, you know, policy outcomes are really just about making a difference in Washingtonians' lives. Uh, before we uh, move on, I would like to say hello to uh, former 41st LD Representative Marcy Maxwell. Hello, my friend. I'm so, you're gl so glad you're on the call with us today. So let's talk about the budget, which, of course, will fund everything that, that happens legislatively. Our state has three budgets, the capital budget, the operating budget, and the transportation budget. What is the difference between the three? Yes, yeah, so we have three. The operating budget is by far the largest. It pays for the day-to-day -day operating of state agencies, colleges, universities, public schools. It has expenses like our employee salaries, benefits, the leases that we have goods and services, uh, what goes to a public school district, public assistance uh, payments, stuff like that. The things that make our um, state operate. Um, the transportation budget pays for operating the capital cost of highways, ferries, bridges, public airports, rail, anything you, um, you uh, think about when you think of transportation. The one little quirk is, it also is where we do our funding for uh, culverts, um, for protecting them. And the reason why that's in transportation is because that's mostly we deal with when we are fixing our roads. And so that uh, construction with the culverts and transportation goes together. So that's part of our transportation budget. 
and a capital budget pays for construction and repair projects. So like a state building, our public schools, our higher education, public lands, parks, um, you know, this is where we make dollars available for things like um, uh, stabilization, um, withdrawal units, uh, we could pay for uh, someone who wanted, you know, like the University of Washington has, uh, they're building the new forensic uh, center of excellence, uh, those buildings. So that's what capital goes for is the actual uh, construction uh, and repair projects around the state. I'm going to ask you a question I've always wondered the answer to. Why does transportation get its own budget? You know, this is something I learned when I joined the uh, legislature. It was, it's actually in the 18th Amendment of the Washington State Constitution. This was actually um, done by a joint resolution in 1943 and approved by the voters in 1944. And this amendment basically says that uh, the constitution actually restricts the expenditure of gas tax and vehicle license fees uh, into a separate fund um, for highway purposes. So it is from the 1940s that we do that. Uh, what we have done is actually put in revenue from licenses and permits as well, as well as tolls and ferry fares. So that's what's in our um, transportation budget. Half of the revenue comes from gas tax and then a fourth from licenses and permits. And the last fourth is from tolls and uh, ferry fares and fees, but it's in our constitution. I will editorially say I'm very grateful for the transportation budget that 978 uh, was uh, ruled uh, unconstitutional. I'll leave it at that. And we will move on and talk about the uh, budget shortfall this year. It's $2.2 billion projected uh, due to the pandemic. You are nonetheless anticipating a balanced budget. How? So, you know, I will say this is where I have been so proud um, of the responsible governing that we have been doing in the state for the last few years. We have a rainy day fund. Um, we, it's, 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 uh, it's called a stabilization account, but I think everyone knows there's a rainy day fund. And we have $2 billion in that rainy day fund that can be used to help us um, fix our budget. So we can move that money from that fund um, into our, um, operating budget and that in essence uh, balances us out. Now the rainy day fund you can't just use anytime you want and you actually have to have certain things happen. You can use that money if 60% of both chambers agree to it. So supposing there was something that there was wide scale agreement on we could use the rainy day fund in order to pay for it. We can also use it by a 50% vote if it is a governor declared emergency. Um, or a 50% vote when a fund balance exceeds 10% of annual revenue. So, um, so we are at a point where 50% of us can vote and move the dollars out of our rainy day fund, uh, also called the budget stabilization account, into our operating budget. And so the $2 billion makes us balance. Now that is balance in terms of dollars, right? That means nothing else changes. We're not adding any more money. We're not doing any more programming. And I will tell you that that is not where we are at. We have to make sure we're helping people survive this pandemic. We have to take a look at what's going on with the homelessness. Uh, we have to take a look at small businesses, how we're going to help them. We have to take a look at healthcare. Um, you know, and the list goes on and on. So while on paper we have a balanced budget, if we really want to help people through this pandemic, we are going to need new revenue. That actually transitions perfectly into the next thing that I wanted to talk with you about, which is austerity. And the last time we faced a financial crisis was the Great Recession in 2009. We had an $11 billion shortfall, I believe. Uh, Republicans instituted austerity measures in response. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about your understanding of what was done and some of the long-term impacts that had. Yes, and thank you so much for that question. Um, I actually remember that very clearly uh, because I was doing my work with the therapeutic court um, units at that time. So we really, really focused in, um, in uh, helping people exit the criminal justice system by providing them with services. And at that time with the 10, over $10 billion cuts, I think you said 11, 
those cuts were made from foundational public services like public health and education. Um, we had 70,000 people lose healthcare coverage. We had seniors who um, lost support and couldn't afford prescription drugs. We had the TANIC program was devastated. And we as a state have, and uh, TANF stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Literally, it's for helping the neediest um, of us all. And um, our current TANF spending is, um, is still so far behind. We're one of very few states that have not restored the TANF funding from what it was before uh, the uh, Great Recession. And I don't think I have to tell anyone listening about the uh, cuts, devastating cuts that were made to behavioral health and substance use disorder. We were trying to just crawl out of those cuts just in the last few years. And a lot of the work I have done in the Senate has been to try to actually shift us back to an early intervention model instead of being um, a, a crisis driven model. And that comes from the cuts that were done during um, the Great Recession. And we're not even talking about education, right? We had education cuts, we had cuts to higher, higher ed. Um, tuition during this time um, doubled for our uh, college students. And so it, it really was devastating uh, for our economy and the recovery from those cuts we are, we have barely gotten through those right now. Uh, you know, 2016, 2017 was when we were finally recovering from the cuts that were made to um, our uh, foundational public assistance from the Great Recession. So, you know, one of the things we heard a lot about over the summer, uh, especially from the Republicans, is they wanted a special session. And I was one who was adamantly opposed to doing a special session because I knew that what we would do would be cuts. And these are the cuts that are helping the most vulnerable in our society. And especially during a pandemic, that is not what we need to do. It's, it's the exact reverse. And at that time, we also were unsure about what was gonna happen at the federal government. Uh, we knew they were working on a package to help the states. And so for me, it was, very clear that we had to clearly understand what was going on with our economy, what was going on with our state, as well as what help we were getting from the federal government before we made cuts. And those cuts, in my opinion, were not needed at that time. And I'm very happy to report that that was the right decision because we saw those um, federal dollars come in and help our state and help individuals. We saw our economic forecast actually improve. And so we are at a point in time where we are talking about a balanced budget. Had we come in and devastated those programs, people would be suffering much more than they are. So I am actually very pleased that um, our leadership could stand up um, and say, no, we're not gonna go into special session and really work with the governor to make decisions on um, helping people. And there's a lot that we did this um, over the summer that has greatly helped people. You know, we were the first to get uh, dollars out uh, to people to help them. We had one of the best, um, most robust safety nets program in the nation. Uh, we had an expanded Medicaid system. We had the healthiest unemployment insurance trust fund. We had a paid family and medical leave insurance system and financial assistance for higher ed and technical training. So we actually were a state that uh, was poised to deal with this pandemic uh, the best in the country. And that really has um, played out. You know, you mentioned that uh, 2017, 2016, 2017 was the time when things turned around. Uh, that corresponds very neatly with your special election. Uh, Senator Karen Kaiser uh, recently said that she believed that we kept feeling the impact of austerity until you were elected and the Democrats took unified control uh, at that time. So elections have consequences, gang. Um, good consequences in this instance. You mentioned federal dollars. Um, now we know that states cannot print their own money. And we also know that Trump and the GOP Senate have been largely opposed to federal money for states. Um, our first audience question, our friend Jonathan Gruden asks, what would Olympia like Congress to do to help with our budget and economic recovery right now? You know, absolutely. We would like more uh, dollars from our federal government. Um, 
you know, as I mentioned, our state is doing better than most other states in the country. Other states are struggling a lot more. So having those uh, dollars, I think, would really be beneficial for us, especially in terms of health care, in terms of our federal safety net programs. And, you know, I got to say, this summer, we saw a um, this great federal experiment, and I'll say it's bipartisan, where they put cash in the hands of people. And we all saw what that did. Um, we saw people being helped by it. We saw their lives improving. And we saw that putting direct cash assistance in the hands of people actually helped our economy. And so I'm really hopeful that the federal government will analyze that information and data from the summer when that was done. I would love for them to do direct cash assistance to Washingtonians, well, to all Americans. Sure. But yeah, and, and, and 100% agreed. And, you know, it, it is looking like uh, the Biden administration intends to send some monies uh, to money to states in addition to direct cash payments. And so uh, the, the, the forecast may potentially be good. So here's the point where I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and talk about let you talk about how the budgeting process works, because uh, that's what everybody's here for today. So uh, we know that Governor Inslee released his budget in December. So uh, what happens after that in the process? So, um, you know, when so the governor releases his budget. So I'll say there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in order for that budget to be released. So I want to make sure people understand that, you know, six months prior to that, people are, are preparing for that uh, budget release. So the governor releases their budget. Um, the Senate and the House, you know, kind of analyze it. Uh, we really do a deep dive into it. We had a hearing in Ways and Means just last week, hearing about um, the governor's budget. Um, we also break it down into um, different components of it. So we, you know, kind of pull out the behavioral health component. We pull out all the different components. And then this is where um, all of us, like chair of the behavioral health subcommittee and uh, Senator Daniel as chair of the human resources uh, committee, we got together with the budget folk and really made sure we understand, you know, what are the assumptions that are being made in the governor's budget? Are those assumptions accurate? Are they consistent with our understanding of what the need is? And then really making sure that there's nothing missing in, in that, that we would like to support, or really making sure that given what we passed uh, in the last biennium, that all of that is covered. So, um, it, it, you know, it is a starting document. And this is where then the negotiations will begin between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office um, on um, what we think about the governor's uh, budget and how we want to tweak it. So the other thing we have to also wait for is to see all the bills that are passed, because if there are policy bills um, that get passed, those have to be reflected in the budget. So the, bu so the governor's budget right now is like this living document that keeps getting um, changed, adapted, amended, and uh, going through that process. So this is where I think it's really imperative for everyone to get involved. We had, um, I think we had 150 um, people testify on the governor's budget on, um, oh gosh, Monday? Um, no, maybe Tuesday, um, last week. And um, you know, give their opinion on what they thought. So we had a lot of pro and con uh, testimony on it. We um, also heard the governor's capital gains um, uh, proposal on um, Thursday. And so this is where we get feedback. Uh, we will be hearing now revenue bills and um, other bills regarding the budget that are proposed by senators in the, in the Senate. And the House will be doing the same in their appropriations um, committee. So this is where we start doing the heavy work of making sure we are all getting on the same page and um, that priorities are uh, being met and funded. Do you anticipate, given everything that we've talked about, uh, that the negotiations are going to be contentious this year? You know, um, I think there is a broad agreement on, on the values and the priorities. Um, so I am um, not too concerned about that component. I think what's going to be challenging is going to be the need for new revenue. As we talked about earlier, we have a balanced budget if we don't fund anything extra, but that is not where uh, any of us Democrats wanna go. We really do wanna make sure that we are helping people. And in order to help people, you need dollars and you need new dollars because 
like you said, the state cannot print money. And so I think this is where how we generate those new dollars is going to be uh, contentious. As I'm sure you know, and all your uh, listeners know, we have one of the worst regressive tax structures in the country. And while I'm really proud of how well the state does nationally on every other level, this is one that we should really all be embarrassed about. And so I really do think that this is an opportunity for us to correct that upside down tax structure and really make sure that the people we're trying to help are not the people who are paying the taxes to help them. That's just a shell game. So I think we really have to make sure we are taking a look and, and really take a look at what the budget has, uh, or this uh, um, pandemic has shown us. I will say the most affluent district in the state is the one that I represent, the 45th legislative district. And um, it's been really, and while I know, I think all of us know that um, we have people with a lot of privilege in our state, but during the pandemic, it was made absolutely clear. Um, I had a neighbor who put the house on the market, guess what, sold, in less than six hours with a line, a COVID safety line going out the door for people to see it. Wow. Um, and we're seeing other people who are starving. We have Washingtonians who don't have food to eat. And so I think this is a really great opportunity to say, let's fix the system. Let's make sure that people are paying their fair share. Uh, share. Right now, a person um, making low wages pays 17% of their income to state and local taxes, while the wealthy few are paying 3%. So every $1,000 a working person earns, they're spending $170 in taxes. And for every $1,000 a wealthy person earns, they're putting in $30. I, you know, that makes no sense. And I guarantee you that if the wealthy person puts in $70, and the poor person puts in 30, the wealthy person is not really going to care. It's not gonna impact their lives, right. but it can be the difference between someone having a home, having behavioral health uh, um, services, having an education system, and really improving their lives um, for the working class person. You're making such a compelling case for progressive revenue streams. And I, I wanna unpack that uh, in, in a big way in just a moment, but I'll just ask you uh, just a couple of follow-up questions to what you were saying about the budget. At what point is the budget usually finalized? The budget, that's one of the last things that we do. Um, so all these conversations continue happening. We keep taking a look at the policy bills that we're funding and what the fiscal note on those policy bills are, because that fiscal note has to be accommodated into our budget. And so if you don't have new revenue coming in, that money has to come from somewhere else. And so that's where the balancing has to occur. So uh, from now on, every time there is a committee hearing and there's a bill that people are discussing, you will notice even on our, um, our website that you'll see a little F and a little F is the fiscal note on a bill. So it's always important to click it and see what that dollar amount is. And if that dollar amount does not fit into um, our budget, then those are the bills that actually don't end up passing because we cannot accommodate the fiscal note. And so, you so that's what's gonna happen in the next few weeks where we are doing the math on a, on a regular basis to see what's passing out of committee, what's coming into ways and means. And um, that's when all the tweaking happens. So it's now until um, the end of session when we, pass the operating budget, uh, we will pass it in the Senate, send it to the House. Um, the House will go through that and hopefully we will have one that matches that the governor uh, is going to sign. And Thank we did you three for times, one for operating, <laughs> one for transportation and one for capital. It's a lot of work. I, I, I appreciate you clarifying all of that. And you, know, you mentioned public hearings. Do you feel that citizen lobbying has uh, an impact on the budget? Absolutely. You know, we heard the capital uh, gains tax bill um, last week, and it is very nice to hear from citizens on both sides. And I'll say residents. You do not have to be a citizen. Immigration status is not uh, relevant for your participation. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, thank you. Um, any resident of the state of Washington can sign in uh, to testify. And I'll just say you don't have to sign in to testify. You also can actually sign in in support um, or against without testifying. And so, you know, everyone gets this list. And so this is where it is nice for us to see that there's an either equal division between the pros and the cons or people who are more pro or more con. So um, don't feel like you have to testify. You can sign in without testifying to show your support um, or be against a bill. 
and send in written testimony. So I think it is a great opportunity for people to get involved. We wanna hear from you. My office, uh, what we do is before, uh, first thing in the morning, my office will actually do a search and compile how many people have emailed uh, pro or con against any bill that I'm hearing that day. And so I know where Washingtonians who have reached out to me feel on a particular topic. I go the extra step and divide it between my constituents and non-constituents because you know everyone emails. And so <laughs> that is very important feedback. Um, I'm also very mindful of organizations that are uh, more organized um, and you know send like a few hundred if not a thousand emails versus those are just individuals reaching out on their own behalf. But it's really, really important that we hear from people. Good point about being organized. And if you hear from, because you know, oftentimes uh, you will hear from some elected officials saying when they get bombarded with a single issue email by like a thousand people, they tend to disregard it. But you're saying that's not the case with you. It's not the case uh, with me. I mean, the form letters, you know, they're coming from individuals. But, you know, I'll give you an example um, of an organization that's been very organized is the NRA. You know, you get a gun bill in the Senate and the number of emails that flood your uh, inbox, it is tremendous. And within that sea of emails, if we had um, local Washingtonians who wanted to have a different point of view emailing as well, it's nice to see that because then the rhetoric on the floor is, well, I got 500 emails saying we're against it. So I think Washingtonians have spoken, we should be against it. So it's nice for me to be able to stand up and say, yes, but we, I have also received 500 for it. So, you know, it is helpful. Um, and, and I think it is always nice to have a counterpoint of view. And I'm not just saying that on progressive issues that I deal with, even issues that I may not necessarily think are a good idea. I want to hear a counterpoint. I want to understand uh, someone else's perspective because I think there are valid perspectives on all sides of an issue. And as lawmakers, for me especially, it's very important that I understand where everyone stands on the issue and make sure we're making a decision that works for everyone. You're being very gracious. I was going to make a crack about NRA uh, the NRA not being able to possibly afford uh, future campaigns. <laughs> and yes. I guess uh, I effectively just did make that crack. Um, so let's talk about I, some I, progressive- I picked that for, for that very specific reason. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh my goodness, if I, if I had some sort of sound effects here, I'd be sounding off like applause and air horns and stuff. Um, so let's talk about progressive revenue now. Um, I know that you are pushing for a number of, of revenue streams for all of the, the meaningful reasons that you've laid out. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about this. So let's just start with the capital gains tax. You, you, you touched on this uh, already. Washington is one of only nine states without a capital gains tax. I, I'm wondering, let's start here. Why do you think that this is such a hard sell in this state, particularly for a state with no income tax? You know, this is, this is really fascinating to me. Um, you know, I got into politics only three, four years ago. Um, and so as a regular Washingtonian who was not politically engaged at all, it has always fascinated me um, the manner in which we deal with revenue in the state. And, and I, I don't know why we have fallen into this rhetoric of um, that the state taxes too much because that is not true at all. We are actually uh, a state that is highly favored by businesses um, and we're highly favored by employees. Um, but we really struggle to provide essential services. You know, I, I, you know, we've talked about behavioral health. We haven't even talked about a foster care system. I cannot tell you if people haven't paid attention to it, it is horrible, the manner in which we are treating our foster kids. Um, you know, it, it's, that, it, it's, it's unconscionable in fact. And a lot of these issues can be fixed with our tax system. If we took the red estate, in the country and took their tax structure and put it and replaced ours with it, it would be so much more progressive than what we currently have. So mm. I really don't know where this narrative has come from in our state, but for all the great policies we have, it's astounding to me that our tax structure is so broken. So I, um, since I got involved in politics, have really been pushing for us to fix the system. But I think people are just afraid that if we start talking about a uh, capital gains tax, that we start talking about you know, uh, ending corporate welfare, if we start talking about um, closing our loopholes, that that just means we're gonna add more taxes and not balance the tax structure. 
Um, and I think that's where that faith in government or that trust or understanding needs to happen. But this is not about generating revenue for the sake of generating revenue. But if we had a system that equalizes um, the input that people have through their through taxes, we could address some of the stuff even with the BNO taxes. You know, let's make sure we're supporting small businesses and not having them pay that high rate. But we can do that if we have another revenue source. Right now, we only have um, very few revenue sources. So I think a lot of it is about this trust that people don't think that um, there will be a leveling for everybody. So um, I'm really hopeful that people are getting more educated, that they're learning um, about it, and really do understand that it is about balancing a tax structure, not imposing more taxes on every single person. I've heard this before, and I'm, I will just confess, I'm personally unclear on what it means when you say we need a balanced tax structure. What is meant by that? You know, so it means if we're getting, um, supposing, and um, supposing we had a income tax, we could then make change, make changes to a BNO tax. A BNO is our... Um, it's a business and occupational business tax. Business and occupational tax, right? Right now, that's at a very high rate. So if we had other revenue coming in, we could actually then fix our BNO so that our new businesses, our small businesses are not paying that high rate upfront, that we could actually provide them um, more security in not paying as many taxes and give them the opportunity to become productive and then start paying higher taxes once they've been in business for a lot longer or have higher uh, revenue coming in. So it's going to be something that can help everyone, not just, um, not just, um, you know, the few rich people. So if that'll give us the opportunity to balance it out, you know, we could then even reduce our sales tax. So when you go to buy something in the store, we don't have to have it at 9%. We could hopefully have it much lower because we have another revenue, uh, uh, stream coming in. So it's like a math problem, you know? Uh, we're not saying we need to increase the end result. It's like, we can still get to the same number um, or maybe increase it a little bit more, but we are distributing um, how we collect that number. So, you know, I actually do like math. Um, so <laughs> let's take a look at that, you know, that problem. Let's take a look at, instead of having three legs to the stool, Let's add seven legs to the stool. And um, that way you can make each of those stools a little shorter. So you're paying less in, but your end result is still the same. Um, so that's what I mean by balancing it out is really sharing that burden of taxes um, out to a, a lot more um, individuals so that people don't feel uh, that they're paying that much. So they really are paying the fair share and we can all get the benefits of that. You know, we right now enjoy our parks. We enjoy having our education system. We like so much that the state has to offer, but that does not come free. Well, so let's talk about a few of these other potential streams. Um, the working family tax credit, I know, is something that you advocate for. Can you talk about that a little bit? So, you know, that is one way that you put dollars back into uh, the people who really need them, because not all revenue streams are um, are um, are progressive, right? So if you have, as we know, like a sales tax, uh, poor people pay a lot more of it than the rich do. So if you have a working families tax credit, you can then take some of that dollars and give it back to the families that are actually paying uh, more of the taxes. So that's, again, getting down to balancing um, who's being burdened by our tax code. Um, so that's one example on how you actually have a process for giving dollars back to families so that the burden of taxes is not that high on them. And then something like a, a corporate payroll uh, head tax. This is similar to what was proposed in Seattle. I, I'm wondering, I'll just sort of play devil's advocate on this, if you would foresee problems with this in a pandemic with, with unemployment being where it is and, and people working remotely. So this is where I think you you don't need a sledgehammer, but a surgical tool when you're dealing with revenue. Uh, you know, I gave the example of the 45th district and how affluent it is. If anyone's watching the stock market, you have seen what's been happening. It's been doing great. So anyone who's been investing in the stock market, good on you. You guys have made a lot of money. Um, and so when we're taking a look at the pandemic, we're not taking money from people or the proposals aren't taking money from people who can't afford it. It's saying you have had a windfall. 
And so let's make sure that you're responsible for that share in an appropriate way. Um, and so it really is, we have to take a look at, even when you take a look at uh, companies, there are companies that have been devastated, our tourism, our um, hospitality. So this is not the time to tax them. They're the ones that need the support. Take a look at our online sales. They're through the roof. Take a look at a lot of our technology companies. They're doing great. Um, and so, you know, that's when I talk about the balancing. You have to make sure that you use that surgical tool so that you're not burdening people who are already struggling, but making sure that those who really are doing great are paying their fair share back into the economy so that um, we can help those that are struggling. Our hospitality industry is going to need a lot of support. Yeah. Small businesses are going to need a lot of support. And we haven't even talked about the higher need for behavioral health services, a homelessness crisis. Um, we have had a, such a spike in overdose um, last year. We have to address that. So there is a lot of need, but we have to take a look exactly at um, how we are raising that revenue to pay for it. Uh, you know, Kat asks, uh, how long do you think it will take ultimately to address the broken system? How many sessions? I and mean, this is speculative, but I, we're, I, I think it's a good question. It is. It's an excellent question because I know I'm being very optimistic and talking about all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but it's, this is a very, very tough thing to get done through, this, through um, the, the Senate and the House. And so there are a lot of proposals. And I'm actually hoping we can pass a couple a few um, progressive revenue uh, proposals, but this is something that is gonna take years of work and it's something we have to keep chipping away at. And I think this is where, you know, you talked about why in the state do we have the worst tax structure? It's about that building that trust and saying that it is not about just adding taxes for the sake of adding taxes, but it is really about flipping our system around so that people aren't paying a lot of taxes, but that we're dividing it up evenly. So everyone is paying their fair share, but people have to trust that that is indeed what is going to happen. And so that is going to take quite a bit of time, I'm afraid, but I'm very hopeful that this session will at least making make good progress uh, in that direction. We're hopeful as well. I mean, we know that, you know, uh, democratic trifectas don't last forever. And so we're, we're hoping that the, the opportunity is there. Before we get to audience questions, I just want to give you a second to talk about uh, your capacity as the chair of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. Um, you've talked about the need for uh, behavioral and mental health services here today. I know that you had public hearings on Friday for uh, three bills. Can you talk a little bit about, a little, a little bit more uh, about how this uh, pandemic has impacted mental health in the state? Yeah, you know, um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I mentioned the high rate of overdose deaths already in our state. We have had such alarming um, information coming from our public health um, and, you know, SAMHSA and all of these uh, federal partners that the need for uh, behavioral health services is going to really um, be extensive. Uh, we're talking about more than 50% of our state uh, residents having some kind of depression or anxiety, um, which happens during um, crises. And you know, there's, a, there's a really nice graph that talks that even when a crisis has gone away, that's when people for the next six months start really coming out of that and feeling a lot of um, um, uh, depression and anxiety around what is happening. And we're not even talking about job loss, homelessness that compounds it. Um, and I got to tell you, the, the information coming out on how it's impacting the well-being of our children is very concerning. Uh, this is the time when they're hanging out with their friends, have social interactions, and that hasn't happened for close to a year. And so the level of anxiety and depression that we're seeing again with our next generation is very alarming and, and the suicide rates again. So um, we got to make sure that we continue down the path of investing in early intervention. We have to continue to make sure we are removing barriers for people accessing behavioral health. Um, and so that's really what you saw on the behavioral health subcommittee um, hearing last week was continue to move us in that direction. And we also have to make sure that we have a public health approach to behavioral health, not a criminal justice um, response. And so um, actually one of the things I'm very excited about is the federal government has authorized a 988 uh, emergency number system. And so we have a unique opportunity 
uh, at this time for our state to create a 988 statewide behavior response system, because it is not illegal for anyone to have a behavioral health crisis. So can can you just tell us uh, very quickly what the, the 988 uh, behavioral health crisis number is and what it yeah. does? So the federal government has authorized this number just like the 911 number. So, you know, everyone knows if you need help, you call 911, law enforcement shows up. This is an opportunity for us to take a 988 number where when you have a behavioral health crisis, that's what you call. And so instead of law enforcement showing up, you have a crisis mobile unit showing up because it's not illegal, right, to have a behavioral health crisis. And so to me, this is, fits in so well with all the conversations we've been having about the use of deadly force, about police accountability, because it's not a law enforcement's job to respond to behavioral health crisis. So it is such a unique opportunity in our state to really build out a robust structure of uh, asking for help and getting the help uh, when people need. And so this number becomes operational in 2022. And so it's really about making sure we are setting up that infrastructure, setting up that, um, the, the resources that we need in order to be good to go uh, the summer of 2022. So people have an option. You know, If you have a kid who has a schizophrenia and you really need help, and you're afraid, frankly, to call 911 because you don't know what's going to happen, you can call 988. Uh, and you know that the response you will get is one that is appropriate for the behavioral health crisis that's happening. So um, that's going to be a big lift uh, this year. Uh, Representative Orwall um, has been, I've been working with her to get this done. So we're setting up a lot of that infrastructure. Uh, you know, we had, we had a hearing on something called the safe station. This is where our fire stations, our EMTs, who respond to individuals for health crisis can actually respond when someone has a behavioral health crisis. They can do that evaluation. They can refer them for uh, substance use disorder treatment. So really making sure that people who have behavioral health crisis have avenues to get help that is away from a criminal justice system. So um, lots of exciting stuff happening in the behavioral health realm. Absolutely agreed. Uh, so we're gonna go audience questions now. We have about seven and we have about 12 minutes left. So I'm hoping we can get to as many of these as possible because they're great questions. And in fact, uh, Kristen Hansen asks, and uh, this is something that you and I were speaking about earlier when we were preparing for our call today. Uh, she says the other, she understands that the Democrats are supposed to be looking at legislation through a race equity lens. Does that apply to the, the budget process? And how is that playing out? Oh my goodness, it's all about the budget. Um, yes, so, um, oh my goodness. Um, so I actually had sponsored a bill in the Senate that created the first ever statewide office of equity uh, in the country. Um, I actually fought all uh, last year to make sure that office was funded and, and, and up and running. Um, so we have that office that's taking a look at equity issues in our state government, so all the agencies. Um, this is what happens when you have two women of color as your deputy majority leaders. Uh, we have been talking about uh, race and equity um, <laughs> since we both got appointed as deputy majority leaders. Um, you will see that happening in the governor's office too, where when they're doing agency request legislation, they have to have an equity statement on there. They have to show some equity analysis on uh, who is being impacted by the program in what way. Um, and, and, and doing that, we in the Senate and the House will be using an equity uh, tool, like a set of questions to make sure we clearly understand exactly those things. Who are the people that are impacted? What do the numbers look like? What are the demographics? And making sure uh, we understand exactly who is at the table and who's not. This is going to be our first time really doing that in our legislate, uh, legislation in a, in a concerted effort. So I am guessing it's not going to go as smoothly. We actually again did a trial run where we took um, an old bill and tried to use that lens to see what uh, the data showed us. Um, so it needs some tweaks, but yes, we are absolutely, absolutely the place where it needs to be applied is to our budget. Because like I said, that is our value statement. And if we're not applying it there, I don't know why else we would use it. Um, so absolutely the budget has to be looked at from an equity perspective. And, you know, 
there are four priority uh, areas, that these, these four buckets, but they're large buckets. Uh, and, you know, th this gets into questions about things like health care. So Debbie asks, how do you see the budget constraints affecting health care, particularly the universal health care work group recommendations? Um, and, I, you know, as I said, health care didn't make it into one of the areas of focus from the Democratic caucus. But do you expect any action on health care this session? That's what our first number one priority was, COVID recovery. Um, that is all about healthcare uh, and access to healthcare. You know, um, the other thing that COVID has done for us is that it's actually given us perfect vision. It's given us 2020 vision. We can all clearly see the inequities that exist in our society. And um, I think the need for universal healthcare cannot be more strongly seen as when we saw all last year. Uh, in terms of access to healthcare. So um, I think when we talk about COVID recovery, we are talking about healthcare. We're talking um, about vaccine distribution. We are talking about preventative um, medicine. Um, you know, one of the number one, I mean, it was all about healthcare last year. And so we absolutely have to make sure that we are uh, ensuring more and more people have access to healthcare. Uh, we had Cascade Care go live in our state, and I was so glad to see that. So we're again moving in the right directions. And this again goes down to progressive revenue that we talked about, right? Because in order to do all the work that we all want to do, we are going to need uh, new dollars. Uh, and so people, for people to say we have enough money in the state, that is simply not accurate. You mentioned Cascade Care, um, and it, it's it's an enormous step toward covering all Washingtonians. Um, but uh, Nicholas asks, will we be able to make uh, some more progress on guaranteeing health care for all, uh, either a bill this session or discussion committee, something like Medicare for all? Um, we weren't able to get there last session. And in fact, that's where the universal health uh, care work group came from. Um, are you in any way optimistic that we can make more progress toward a universal health care coverage oh system? Um, you know, Senator Frock has really been leading the charge on this. Um, and I know he's invested in continuing to work in this arena. I am not really sure how much progress we're going to make, frankly. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, it's being a remote session, we are hearing a lot fewer bills than we were last year. I mean, 50% is less is actually a conservative number. So um, so to me, I, I think some of the constraints of um, a remote session will come into play when it comes to this. But uh, I think there are a lot of us who are just very passionate about making sure we are moving in that direction. But uh, I would say watch what Senator Frock does. He is a huge advocate in this area and it was um, his bill that, um, that is taking a look at creating the pathways to um, universal healthcare. When we started our conversation, we talked about uh, one of the uh, upsides to having an online session was the fact that you had much more civic participation, often from people you know who are remote to the Olympia area. So Elise Bowditch asks, what plans are there to continue promoting citizen participation through virtual meetings after COVID fades? What a great question. I mean, if we have uh, found a way uh, to, to, to make uh, the session more accessible uh, through you know, technology, why not continue that? Absolutely. You know, I um, even during the interim, I had so many Zoom meetings with so many people. Um, you know, clearly this was more than a full-time job, even though it's supposed to be a part-time position. I wish I worked only 40 hours a week. Um, it's been actually um, overwhelming um, how much people have reached out and wanted meetings, and I've been wanting to accommodate that. Um, so, you know, we, we actually have to figure that out because I can tell you I did not have any sort of work-life balance um, this last year as a part-time legislature. I mm -hmm. didn't go back to my other job because I literally did not have time um, to, to do that. So, so absolutely, I think this is a great opportunity for us to be more engaged. Uh, and, and I was, we had, we used to have regular meetings with small businesses, uh, um, minority owned small businesses on the East side. And we were able to have meetings with 80, 90, 100 people because people could just zoom in from wherever they were. So I think the participation that we have uh, seen in our democracy has been tremendous and I would love to capture it. But I think we also have to be realistic on the expectations on a part-time legislature. 
um, because many of us who really do care and want to make sure we heal from people, we're not doing this part time. Uh, and, and we have to somehow understand that reality. I will ask you, see if you have any insight into this at all, because it would seem that there is a disproportionate representation of people in our legislature who can actually afford to do this work. You know, so you have a lot of small business owners, you have professionals, people who own their own businesses, um, and not a lot of representation from people who are often negatively impacted by, say, the lack of capital gains tax and things like that. Do you foresee or do you know of anybody who is advocating for a, to, to, to make our, our legislature a full-time legislature and to begin to pay uh, lawmakers a living wage? So, you know, it, I think it, politically, it, you, I don't know how you um, justify increasing legislative salaries uh, when people are struggling and suffering. Sure. Um, so I think politically, that is a very, very hard thing for us to do. But that is why we get the people representing us uh, that we do. You know, I talked um, about it a lot when I decided to run for office. I could afford to run for office because my job literally said you could go on a leave of absence, but you can still come back and work if you lose. I didn't get a salary, obviously, because I went on a leave of absence, but that was okay because my husband was earning. You know, he had a good job. He could support us. I will tell you a side note, actually, when we decided um, to run for, when I decided to run for office, we were chatting with my kids and my daughter looked up the salary and she goes, I don't think we can afford to live um, mm. on a senator's salary. And my son says, well, I can, I can start teaching coaching chess and I can contribute to the household. And my daughter said she could like babysit and help the family. And, and, you know, I said, no, your father and I have it. It's okay. We can afford for me to run for office. And you are going to get people from affluent backgrounds running for office because they're the ones who can afford to, or people who are older and retired or have a different stream, uh, stream of income. But take a look at the number of renters in Olympia. You don't see a lot of renters because people who are renting um, have a harder time living on the salary that uh, legislators make. So, you know, when you talk about representation, this is why representation matters. But you can get elected, but if you cannot live on, I think it's up to 52,000 a year, you're not gonna be able to get a career um, as a legislator. So, you know, these are the things that make a difference on the policies we hear. Um, this is why, you know, childcare was a, a bigger issue when you see more women and younger women running for office because it impacts their lives and their ability to be professionals. Uh, this is when you start talking about um, uh, assistance to renters is when you have renters in, in Olympia. And so representation at all aspects makes a very big difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I've had this conversation with Senator Elias. I've had it with Representative Jesse Johnson. Um, it doesn't seem like there are any good answers, uh, unfortunately. One last question for you, and then we will let you have your Saturday back. So Maria asks, what are the next steps for ensuring a temporary roof, health care, and essentials for Washington's, she says, houseless people? The wording seems intentional, so that's how I'll say it. How is the, the legislature working to help this population? And thank you. That, um, that is a very appropriate phrase to use. We are trying to use houseless. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we did last legislative session is give this uh, authority to counties to actually be able to do this tax to help specifically with, um, with individuals who don't have um, a house. And we saw that play out in King County, and I was very pleased to see what they have done with this tax. They're actually using this tax to help uh, buy motels and hotels that are not being used and convert them um, into housing. And the reason why this has just been so critical and crucial is we have seen so many people complain that all the dollars we've put into helping individuals struggling with, um, with a home um, that you know, it's not really showing the results. And guess what? When someone has a room and a door that they can shut and lock, you're seeing these great improvements in their lives. And you know, this makes a lot of sense. I don't have to tell new parents what a good night's sleep does for your ability to function the next day. It's the same for our individuals that are struggling. And so we are actually seeing um, people actually uh, improve their behavior health um, and just improve the quality of life because they have a door they can lock. 
And for people who are not, um, don't know a lot about the way our shelters work, they kick people out at like six in the morning. So you have to take all your belongings, carry them, walk the streets, then stand in line in the evening. So hopefully you will get a bed for that night. They, they spend the whole day trying to figure out what to do with their belongings and walk around trying to get services and support. So being able to have a room that you can call your own, where you can shut the door and feel safe sleeping and getting that good night's sleep is a game changer. And I really do hope that when advocates really think about how we're going to help our houseless situation, we are taking a look at the data and the improvements we're getting from individuals who have their um, own room. We have talked about so many great pieces of legislation, so many that you yourself uh, are behind that you're spearheading and, and prime sponsoring. So uh, I guess the last question uh, for you would be, you know, you're, you are talking right now ultimately to what will be an audience of about 5,000 uh, individuals across the state uh, who are very motivated, uh, political, you know, uh, activists, progressives. What would you need from Indivisibles to help get some of these policies enacted? I think you, you have to make sure you are signing on to um, bills, sign on in support, uh, sign up against, uh, have your voices heard. It is really important. You don't have to testify uh, if you don't want to. I think that's absolutely fine. If you want to, absolutely go ahead and do that. But it is easy to sign up. Uh, a signing up does close an hour before the hearing. So don't wait for that last minute. Um, but our agendas come out a week before. So make sure you take a look at the agenda. It is easy to follow particular bills. Uh, it is easy to follow particular committees. And, and really make sure you're signing in pro, con. Um, if you have amendments or changes to be made, make sure you're doing that. You know, it is nice to get that little sheet on committee sign up and see that 50 people have signed in pro. Um, hopefully not all 50 will testify, please don't. Um, we will never get to bills or have any conclusions. <laughs> um, so please be mindful of that. Um, but you know, make sure you get involved. It's a great opportunity to do so. I know that Kat will put up links for people uh, with all that information. And of course, I will have that information for people at indivisiblepodcast.org. Senator Dingra, it is always such a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, you are just a wealth of knowledge and we are so lucky to have your service. Thank you so much. I always love doing this and I tend to be an optimist, but I want people to know it's going to take a lot of work to get progressive revenue. We need everyone engaged because it is a big lift. So um, please make sure you're engaged in this process because we cannot do it without all of your support. Thank you so much, my friend. Have a wonderful Saturday. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. And I will wish the same to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us here today for this program. My name is Stephan Cox. I am the host of the Washington State Indivisible Podcast at indivisiblepodcast.org. And I will turn things back over to Kat with a couple of quick announcements.